Welcome into another episode of the Young Turf Podcast. I'm Ed Gaffier and Mason Viner breaking down Maryland's 31-9 win over Michigan State in East Lansing. Let's start it off as we always do on the post-game pod. Instant takes. Ahmed, go ahead. Yeah, obviously, I think uh, the, the, the fast start was what a lot of fans were happy to see. But I think the defense, obviously, with being able to uh, could finish with five takeaways there, obviously a couple in the fourth quarter to help seal the win. Um, I think this is the big thing. Uh, I think just kind of going into the 2023 season, I thought, you know, a lot of Maryland fans recognized what Deontay Banks, what Ja'Cory and Bennett were able to do in terms of past deflections, but kind of being able to translate some of those deflections into turnovers. And, um, you know, Maryland's shown a lot of those flashes really through, the, through non-conference play, but I thought that really stuck out today. Uh, was a really big piece in why Maryland won. Um, yeah, I thought that was uh, definitely an encouraging sign. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. I'll go ahead and talk about uh, safety play. I mean, I think that that is the thing that's stuck out uh, all day between Glenn Miller, Bo Braid, and Dante Trader. The amount of impact plays the Terps can get from the secondary players, specifically the two quarterbacks of the defense, as they like to call them. Um, Dante Trader is all over the field when he's playing and with his uh, running mate in that Bo Braid back out there today. The Terps defense uh, just looked really strong, especially in run support. That's something that you have to watch with this team uh, as they still, I feel like, are developing their defensive line. But check another box on Maryland's Big Ten uh, bucket list, I guess, or checklist. They finally get a win in East Lansing. They've been close a couple of times, but they finally uh, get it done today with a convincing final score. But I'm not exactly sure if it was the most convincing whole game performance that we've seen from Maryland. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think, you know, a lot of fans, uh, like, you know, like I said, you know, the, the best start is I think what a lot of fans would like to see. Now, I think that next step for Maryland is to obviously play that 60 minute game. Um, you know, the, the offense, I think, was able to really find its groove through that first half, obviously, but kind of some lulls there, obviously, that interception there in the red zone by Talia uh, in the third quarter, second drive of the second half there. Uh, so obviously some, some things to, to clean up. And like I said, that 60 minute. Uh, complete performance is probably something Maryland will look at uh, against Indiana with Ohio State coming up next. So uh, definitely, definitely some some room to work with. But uh, to steal a Mike Loxley quote, uh, it's always e easier to correct those mistakes after a win. It sure is. And the Terps get it done uh, in East Lansing. Ahmed, let's talk. Uh... Let's talk defense first. We, we've been talking offense first most of the time. Let's uh, let's jump over to the defense. We both mentioned it in our instant take. Uh, what did you see out there from Terps? Uh, only give up nine, but Michigan State definitely moved the ball. Yeah, obviously, it's pretty interesting, you know, when you look at the final score and then look at uh, Michigan State ended up, uh, I think it was 14 total yards that, that Michigan State ended up uh, out yarding Maryland uh, in today's win. Uh, but obviously, like you said, you know, just kind of with the, the takeaways there and obviously Maryland, you know, kind of having to deal with a couple or uh, enjoying a couple short fields uh, to lead to potential score opportunities, I think uh, contributed in kind of maybe that, you know, that, that little disparity there. But um, like you said, you know, obviously just kind of setting, setting the tone off early uh, with that bow braid interception. Uh, obviously he missed last week's game with a concussion there. So, um, obviously, like you said, Dante Trader, Bo Bray, both of those guys finished one, two uh, in terms of tackles. Uh, but um, yeah, definitely, like you said, just kind of the, the, the encouragement there uh, and kind of, you know, forcing Noah Kim to, you know, really make make the deep throws and whatnot. I thought Michigan State, you know, obviously they were able to find a little bit of success, but the consistency really wasn't there. And I thought it was a big reason why that Spartans weren't able to, you know, they, 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 they saw some success, but it really was a Maryland bend, don't break kind of defense. Yeah, and I think that's what we've seen from Maryland uh, as they've kind of strengthened this unit. And I think today was one of the uglier nine points that you give up games that you'll see from a defense as a unit. I thought you mentioned some of those deep balls. I think Tarheeb still, despite him picking up another interception on the season, uh, is struggling a little bit in that boundary corner spot right now. He seems to, you can kind of see from his reactions after the plays, not necessarily be all the way happy with where he's at right now, despite still being able to make some big plays. Uh, two... Different items, I think, was Maryland continues to work out their rotation. Isaac Bunyan, obviously one of the few injured rotation players that uh, Maryland had today, was uh, a revised rotation that brought Caleb Wheatland down into the box, kind of in that Sam Jack hybrid linebacker spot that the Terps have had. They found a role for him there, and he picks up a sack uh, and a half on the game today. So a bit of a change for Wheatland to get him on the field more. I think Jayshon Barham should probably also move into that rotation down there to get him on the field more. But just the amount of guys that Maryland is playing 
uh, in that front seven, especially at linebackers, seeing them go three deep with that rotation. We've talked about it here as one of the strengths of the team, but ultimately that, and, and I mentioned it on our Tuesday pod this week, but I'll say it again, uh, either Gavin Gibson needs to get all the way back for Maryland to really solidify that defensive backfield, but the Terps have got to find a nickel back. The Lionel Whitaker, Corey Coley, uh, Glenn Miller rotation on there is, is I think, leaving a little bit of a hole in this defense, and it might be the only one that's really still outstanding for what has become a really, really solid group that forces a lot of turnovers, three interceptions on the day for the team. They forced three fumbles, recover two, so six opportunities for turnovers in that. Uh, they get a, that fourth down stop, which you can almost add that as another turnover. Uh, and then again, strong on the two point conversions of short yardage situations. They were a little bit, they didn't never really push the line back on, but overall full body of work. What matters is the amount of points that your uh, opposition has up on the board. And so far this season, you know, 20 points from that Charlotte team is the high against them with a garbage time touchdown. So you'll say really 14 meaningful points uh, in any given game that came from Virginia early in that one. And Charlotte as well is really where this team sits and, that that should definitely put a smile on your face as a Maryland fan. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And you mentioned Caleb Wheatland. I think he's a guy. I mean, when you see him, I think uh, I know he obviously that linebacker room. You know, we talked about it, especially that inside linebacker room is just so deep. So many guys can kind of come out different tandems. Just a lot of a lot of different combinations that really adds a lot of versatility to that defense. But like you said, I think Wheatland with that you know the classic linebacker you know neck roll whatnot, and I think he's just uh, um, just a fan favorite. I think you know and fans got a chance to see a little bit of him. I believe it was last week uh, going into that Virginia game when he was up at the podium. But uh, today, obviously, he uh, left a big imprint on the game, uh, leading the defense uh, with a sack and a half uh, TFL. Uh, TFL and a half as well uh, in the win there. But uh, like you said, just kind of being able to find that nickel corner, I think is a key emphasis. And I think, you know, Vontae Williams, you know, is a guy that we haven't seen a ton of really through these first four weeks of the season. Obviously, Gavin Gibson kind of coming back. This is his second week back, uh, coming to dealing with a, a lower leg injury that uh, sidelined him from the second scrimmage on. Um, but yeah, you know, I thought Glenn Miller, you know, I think he's done really well. And I think he's a really big asset in run support. And I think, you know, when, when he's on the field, more often than not, you're able to kind of feel his presence. Um, but, you know, again, you know, just kind of figuring out that third corner, which, you know, Corey Goley, he's another guy that he's kind of been able to kind of um, get had those moments where he's been able to step into the rotation as a boundary corner, uh, but still so, kind of some work to do there. So um, definitely some work to do. But I think, you know, just kind of going against Indiana, uh, I think Merrill will be able to maybe try and experiment a little bit before, uh, before they have to gear up for this Ohio State uh, passing attack. Yeah, and we finally actually saw Avante Williams in the field, in the game, making a play. I think he it was either the first or the second kickoff of the game where he was the one that made the tackle for Maryland when it was seen multiple times on the sideline. So definitely, I think as he works his way into the rotation, he can factor in at that spot. But bottom line is this team, you know, the way they like to play physically, the way they like to have their corners and secondary members up and run support. To do that, you really have to be able to play man-on-man, -man, you know, unsupported defense or or having a safety like Dante Trader was on one of the deep balls that Noah Kim connected on where he's up in the box and is he's really supposed to backfill and, and be that that kind of cover in that case that center field or cover safety uh in the specific scenario that I'm talking about and he's just not there and, and when your corner is relying on that support that's one thing that I think B will will point out to his guys this week is you know we got to be in our spots a little bit everybody loves to run up and make those big hits on this defense but you have to you know have that eye discipline have that discipline to stay in that and not bite the play action fake like we've seen them. Those are the only times this defense is really getting burnt right now is when uh, Trader and Braid and Miller really want to step up and make a big play, and they're just not where they're supposed to be. I think that's that's my one thing that when really sticks out when you watch them against the deep ball. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think you kind of saw – some of those uh, concerns or weaknesses kind of show up in, in week two, week three, uh, with a couple of those big plays as well. Uh, but yeah, yeah, again, I think you know, you know, Michigan State they they you know were able to find some success, but still can uh, finish three of twelve on yards, fifteen or your, yard, fifteen yards or more downfield uh, in this win. So I think you know, again, Michigan, Maryland secondary, um, again, kind of a bend, bend, don't break mentality, kind of for them specifically. Um, but you kind know, of still able to keep a lot of that in front of them. But uh, definitely, I think, you know, kind of when you look at the secondary, uh, it was pretty clear that you, you kind of felt Bo Braid's presence back on the field uh, as he and uh, Trader, like we said, finished 1-2 on the team in tackles. 
All right, and let's flip it over to the offense. But before we do that, I'm going to welcome a podcast sponsor back with us here on the Young Terps. Our first sponsor has returned with us to help out here with the show, and that is Water Crafters in Gaithersburg, Maryland, who has been providing swimming pool services and supplies to the Montgomery County and Howard County communities for the past 41 years. There is no better place to get your pool closed with this winter than Water Crafters. They're highly skilled service staff. Uh, I just mentioned they can close your pool. They can open it come springtime as well as provide new equipment installations, repairs, and weekly service. The Gaithersburg Retail Showroom has everything for your swimming pool, including chemicals, parts, and fun accessories. Visit Water Crafters in the Gaithersburg Air Park or online at watercrafters.com. We thank them for sponsoring us here on the show once again. Um, and just big shout out to them. They're our first sponsor here on the show with us. And as we build back up the Young Turfs pod, they're back with us here Uh, as a podcast sponsor. So talking offense, I think the Terps had the strong start that everybody wanted to see Ahmed, but then kind of slowed down uh, coming out of the halftime break. Yeah, uh, I think, um, you know, obviously, like we said, just kind of being able to, to, for the offense especially, uh, I think, you know, they should get credited because of the defense. You know, obviously, Bo Braid kicked off the game with that interception. And then the the offense was kind of able to go out and, and kind of capitalize there, turn that into points there. So, um, you know, uh, Maryland turned in touchdowns on their first three drives. Uh, and again, just were able to really find their groove. Didn't look like there were, you know, a ton of big plays and especially maybe the running game and whatnot. Kobe McDonald was able uh, to flash there for a 25 yard gain. Uh, but again, you know, we got to the second half. Um, Maryland got into the red zone and, uh, you know, it was an ill advised pass by Talia trying to force it into uh, Ty Felton and partly, you know, a good catch by the, the Michigan State DB there to, to reel in the interception. But uh, nonetheless, uh, points that could have gone on the board that didn't, that probably could have helped end the game a little bit earlier, helped crush the Spartan spirit uh, a little bit earlier in the game to, to kind of maybe set the tone going into uh, going into the second half. So, um, like you said, I think there were a little bit of lulls. Just, you know, you, you saw it last week when you talked to Talia, when you talked to Deshaun Jones, you know, they felt, yeah, yeah you know, there's some success, but, you know, there's still – other layer that we can probably get to another level where, you know, that, that we kind of all recognize uh, what this passing tech is capable of. And we haven't seen it yet. Um, kind of hope that we would for a 60 minute stretch against, especially against a Spartan secondary that, you know, Chuck Brantley, he was out today. Um, so that was, um, you know, they, they had some depth concerns there, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I think one, one thing that did stick out to me was Deshaun Jones looked like, I didn't see him on the field at all in the first half. I believe I saw him a little bit in the second half. But, uh, you know, Maryland able to find 11 different receivers in the win. Uh, I think, you know, again, a lot of what we saw the first three weeks, you know, a lot of good and, you know, a little bit of bad. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, one of the biggest good things I think of was the play calling in the first half. I thought that was exceptional from Josh Gaddis and Kevin Sumlin to really put together a good game plan to come out here. The biggest thing that I will say and and – Maryland fans love to be critical of the coaches. So I think this is one spot where you really have to give them props is the new corner that was out there, Rucker 25 for Michigan State, freshman out there first game. Maryland constantly, immediately adjusted their game plan to attack that weakness of Michigan State's defense. And and as the game settled in, credit to Rucker. He got better uh, as the game went on. But early they identified that. The biggest stat that jumps out to me in this one has to be Maryland's rushing attack, especially Roman Hemby. Uh, 10 carries for 12 yards in the game. Not a strong game from Hemby. Maryland really struggling between the tackles uh, to run it. Uh, Their zone looks with Antoine Littleton, their counter looks a little bit stronger. That got him going, but still no more than 40 yards from any of Maryland's rushers in this game. And the the big play that I think really sold it for me, really made this a stronger win for Maryland, was Octavian Smith's late touchdown on that screen pass. Just showed, even though it was a screen, that Leah bounced back, still delivered a strong ball. Maryland was struggling in the screen game throughout this one. And and when you look at, you know, year-over-year improvement and what Locks has talked about working with Leah, it is being able to come back and still deliver good balls uh, to his receivers late in the game when things may not might not be going exactly the way that he wants them to. I thought the read option was a really good look, and Maryland just did a strong uh, – part of really closing the game out fast. The middle of the game, they struggled, but Locks always says he wants to finish it stronger. But I do really think Maryland came back and finished the game strong. It was that kind of third quarter where the game, the the you know air was just out of the ball for both teams. Neither, neither team was moving the ball particularly well. It's kind of up and down, turnovers going both ways. It was not uh, the best football game, I would say, to watch. It was not really well played by both teams down the stretch. 
Yeah, I would say that. Um, in, in regards to the running back room, uh, Mike Loxley said that post game. He said that uh, Roman Hemby was a little bit limited this week with you know dealing with some nicks and bruises there. Um, so if you take hit him, uh, obviously Colton Spangler's 14 yard rush that helped uh, extend the drive, and Octavian Smith he added another five yard run. Uh, Maryland, you know, the, the running backs almost averaged six yards per carry, and obviously you know you know we talked in the past, you know, the last couple of weeks, Colby McDonald, a guy that's really been able to kind of step up, capitalize. Uh, on the reps, uh, you know, initially where it's been Littleton losing because of an uh, uh, unsportsmanlike call. And ever since then, McDonald's kind of picked up and run or picked up uh, the, the carries there and, and finished, uh, you know, pretty strong, I'd say. You know, obviously finishing today with 38 yards, 25 uh, yard uh, long uh, on, on, the, on the drive there. But, um, you know, I think just being able to find a little bit more balance and a little bit more consistency on the ground, I think obviously. You know, you want Roman Hemby back, obviously back at 100%, um, or what he's able to do in the second level, making guys miss, things like that. So um, I think think that's, you know, maybe an, you know, an area where Merrill wants to continue to uh, just kind of build on it. But you mentioned the play calling, and I think, you know, Merrill did a really good job just kind of creating balance kind of throughout the game. I mean, almost uh, second and third and fourth quarter, almost uh, an identical split between pass and run plays and just kind of really – uh, just kind of taking advantage of what, what Michigan State was kind of able to do. So, uh, again, I think it kind of just goes back to uh, the biggest thing going into next week is just kind of being able to play that complete game, like you said, just in that middle part, that third quarter there, uh, that lull where Merrill was able to, you know, convert a little bit more. Um, and then I think offensively, I think, uh, you know, falls on special teams. But uh, I think just kind of with, with the way that the, some of these offensive drives ended, uh, Maryland's kicking game, obviously, with Jack House finishing – uh, one of three with misses, I believe, from 28 and uh, 40 yards out uh, in in the game. So, um, you know, a little, little bit of concern there. So uh, we'll, we'll see if, if that unit's able to bounce back against Indiana. Yeah, I, that was one thing that I wanted to bring up was the kicking game at this point, I think, goes into the concern uh, bucket. I, I thought that a lot of people saw Howes in those first couple of games, knocked down a couple of kicks, thought, you know, he's not going to be Chad Ryland right away, but definitely can add to Maryland in that spot. Um, they just, you got to know if you're locks, you know, you got to go to your kicker. Obviously you want to put those points up on the board, but you know, whatever they need to do, maybe to clean up the unit there. I saw, you know, the snap really having Spangler have to rotate the ball a couple of times, get the laces out, you know, just work through getting that clean as you ease a new player into that role. That's going to be real important for Maryland. If they find themselves in close games, the other spot is the punting game for Maryland. I feel like is extremely strong. You know, they obviously they convert on the yeah. fake, which is something we haven't seen this team do. I believe in years. I know they tried a couple under Durkin, but they were never really successful with that. That was definitely a step up in that area that Maryland pulled that, you know, kind of rabbit out in that moment. Uh, and then, you know, should have had a punt that was pinned within the three, but nobody downs it and it ends up in the end zone and an overall real strong average and game from Colton Spangler, who has become, you know, kind of a silent strength of Maryland's team is being able to punt the ball and, and have a punter that can hit those inside the 10, inside the 20 pins for you. Yeah, uh, and I think, you know, Maryland last year, you know, obviously I think it was, you know, Mar uh, Spangler and Anthony Pecorella kind of splitting duties a little bit and end up being kind of Spangler taking the bulk of those uh, punts there. So uh, I think, you know, kind of that, that special unit, that, that third unit, excuse me, um, could potentially be a strength. And, you know, again, like you said, just kind of figuring out Jack Howells. Again, it's not, you know, uh, you look at the stats. I mean, he made a 48-yarder today and then he missed uh, 29 and a 40-yarder. So, I mean, he has the length and we or the distance, and um, we've kind of seen it in the past. Obviously, I know uh, he missed that 55-yarder uh, a couple weeks ago. But, again, you know, probably just something, you know, a little bit more consistency or whatnot. I think that's maybe um, maybe, maybe, maybe the biggest kind of concern uh, that I wasn't expecting uh, kind of going into the season. So, uh, But, again, you know, when you talk about the offense and whatnot, just kind of being able to find that rhythm and, and the big plays there, uh, I think that that's kind of – what we've kind of been able to see flashes of um, and just, again, just doing it for a 60 minute stretch uh, is, is the big thing now. All right. couple more things to get to first off, got to give us props on our betting picks this week. Uh, I think we hit both, uh, both of us take the over on Maryland's points, which hits uh, 30 and a half. Maryland just beats that one out with 31. And then obviously the Terps uh, on the game line, even if you took it at the end when it reached seven and a half came back down to seven for those of you that track it today. So wherever you found it, uh, Maryland covers and both of us uh, successful picks and, and pretty much spot on with with score predictions not quite on the nine side but really had Maryland's offense uh, pinned in right in those low 30 numbers 
uh, for today. Quick look ahead before our Tuesday show. Uh, Marilyn Welcome is in Indiana to College Park Family Weekend coming in. Looks like a really strong crowd. And and as of now, you know, even though we're getting some real bad weather here in Maryland today, uh, a week from now, you know, so far looks like it's going to be sunny uh, and in the 70s. So perfect uh, fall football weather comes to College Park. But real quick, what, what are you looking for for Maryland next week? And what probably should be, a, I'm thinking Maryland, probably a 10-point favorite uh, come tomorrow when we see those initial lines. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it'll be pretty interesting to see uh, Walt Bell, uh, Anthony Tucker, uh, both former Maryland assistants back in College Park next weekend. Uh, but yeah, again, uh, I think just again, you know, like I you know, mentioned a couple of times, I just want Maryland to play that 60 minute complete game. Um, I, I kind of want that rushing game to kind of have that breakout performance, uh, kind of force defenses to play a little more, a little bit more honest against what what should be a balanced, uh, uh, balanced offense. Uh, for Maryland. Um, and then again, you know, I want Maryland to be able to kind of take advantage of some of these big plays. I think I've been able to see flashes of it. Uh, Caden Prather was able to show flashes through non-conference play, obviously leading the team in, in receptions today. But uh, I just kind of want that that offense to kind of fi- find its group there, hit that next le- uh, next level going into, um, you know, a, a really big game on the road against Ohio State. Yeah, I I think for your defense, you want to see more more of the same. A team that put up three points against Ohio State, uh, fourteen points last week against Louisville. Right now, they're they're playing as we record this pod. Uh, they're about to head into halftime, up seven seven three, I think, right now against Akron, which is not a good team, not having a strong year uh, in, in the FBS. So Indiana probably an opponent that you can expect to run out of the building. And and that's what I want to see. You know, we'll talk about it more on Tuesday, but you talked about the complete 60 minutes for me. It's just really being able to show that from start to finish, you know, they really do finish the game. They take, you know, you mentioned taking the spirit out of Michigan state. I think I said that on, over on the Turp talk post game show that we did right after was they just never took advantage of, of that moment. Like it was there when you're driving down the field and you throw an interception in the end zone, you miss a field goal, Finishing everything and doing it right, I think that's something that Lox is going to talk about, whether you call it the complete 60 minutes or really, you know, finishing drives, finishing the game. I think that is what you want to see from Maryland. And then I I really would like to see them continue to convert short yardage third downs. I think that's something that this team struggled with uh, with Lox. I think they have a much better pattern, whether it's the quarterback sneak or Antoine Littleton running between the tackles. Just those little things continuing to build on those and then obviously having your defense dominate the game, which is come to I think everyone's come to expect uh that that heads out to the game and that falls this team is that the defense will dominate it but more on that on the Tuesday show Ahmed anything uh else to add on Michigan State no I mean I just think you know um uh, you know Maryland fans going into Iowa State you know a lot of fans that said what they you know 4-0 4-0 that's what we want um and I think you know Maryland fans obviously you know they were able to take some shots today um still some things to work on but I think you know this is a really sound team and I think that a lot of the the unforced the dumb penalties the dumb errors that we've seen in the past like yeah they still they're still coming up but they're not as not as many as you know in years past um so I think there's a lot to be excited about obviously you know winning in East Lansing for the first time in uh in 83 years or 73 years there I think that's uh you know a feat in itself there but uh again I think that this this team kind of has a chance to really hit its drive, uh, stride going into the the heart of uh, conference play. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And, and and on that point, I mean, everybody asks for this team to be 4-0 right now. Um, those of you that, that have doubted it and said you won't go out to the games, you know, they never win this game, they're not in that moment. You know, I would take that this time to almost embrace the fact that Maryland's going to be 4-0 and has that big chance to, you know, have a crowd at home, 330 home game, get out there. You know, it's probably going to be the last game this year at CQ where the weather is going to be any sort of kind of decent to sit outside and and enjoy a football game. I would say that it's, it's it's really time for people to, you know, basically shut up and show up to the games. You know, if you're, if you're somebody that's followed this and has given every excuse to not go out to the stadium and support the team, I think that, that they're starting to really answer a lot of those questions. Um, and, And you mentioned the stupid penalties and, Frankly, I really like that Loxley seems a little bit pissed off even when they're beating a team like Michigan State 31-9 to on the road. I, I like yeah. that when we show him after the 15-yard penalties in the game and after even some of the five-yard penalties in the game, he's clearly, as well as the other coaches, pissed off. You know, I yeah. think that that's something that, that I like to see, that they're they're rewarding the guys that play a clean game. They're taking the guys out when they get a penalty, and, and they're they're trying to do everything to make that Terps versus Terps, as they call it, in you know, inside Jones Hill House. 
uh, be a non-factor and, and really, you know, step up and just play a clean game, do things right and, and go about, you know, building a program that's that's not going to make those mistakes and that that plays plays a much better, much cleaner game. Yeah, that, exactly. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I know it's a cliche. I know it sounds just co- like coach speak and, you know, I, I, like I, I get it. I completely get it. If you're a fan, you see it and you roll your eyes. But, you know, that's, you know, what in terms of first terps, it's kind of just what it's all about, you know, just setting the standard for yourself. And if you're setting that standard for yourself, it doesn't matter what other people are doing. You know, you're you're unhappy or you're happy based on what you know that you can do based on, you know, X, Y and Z. So, uh, again, a lot, lot to, to be happy about. And um, we'll see if it's enough to be one of the big boys. Yeah, well, not quite yet. We'll talk Indiana on Tuesday here in the podcast. Uh, as always, give this podcast a like, give it a thumbs up on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Drop us a review. Make sure you subscribe and click that download button. Really helps us out here uh, on the podcast. For Ahmed Gafir, I am Mason Viner. And as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.